And now, right to your hosts of Down the Garden Path, Joanne Shaw and Matthew Dressing. Welcome to Down the Garden Path, where we discuss down-to-earth tips and advice while doing our best to help you seasonally manage your garden and landscape. I'm Joanne Shaw, owner of Down to Earth Landscape Design, and with me is my co-host, Matthew Dressing. Hello, Matthew. Hello, Joanne, and good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Matthew Dressing, owner of Natural Affinity Garden Design. As landscape designers and gardeners, we believe it's important and possible to have great gardens, which are sustainable and low maintenance, and we wanna help you make it happen. Uh, a show about this on. Um, so that'll happen in a few weeks. Uh, unfortunately, our guest had a little bit of a family emergency, so that's okay. Um, and Matt is teaching, so you guys have me tonight. Uh, if Matt can join us later, hopefully. But otherwise, I am excited to talk about, because we've been talking about edibles, <laughs> and not those kind of edibles. <laughs> um, all month, we've been talking about the edible gardening. I, as a landscape designer, I'm often tasked with the challenge of how to incorporate our edible plants and our edible gardens into our landscapes. And not everybody has a ton of space and not everybody likes the look of, of vegetable gardens. So I'm excited tonight to talk to you a little bit about some of my ideas. I love to hear from your ideas. If you've got some creative ways that you've made your garden, your vegetable garden look quote unquote prettier or beautified it at all. I would love to hear from you. So you can reach out as usual here at instudio101 at gmail.com. If you do have questions about the garden and your vegetable gardens, then also join, you know, feel free to ask uh, questions. But uh, yeah, so I've just wanted to, you know, put my designer hat on the show today. And Gary's going to be my partner, right, Gary? I am here for you. <laughs> Thank you. So I think, you know, when people, when if you picture a vegetable garden, if somebody says to you, like, come see my vegetable garden, you are expecting a big rectangle or maybe a square, right? The whole uh, four by four um, square gardening and square foot gardening. That's often what people picture. Right. And that's, that's right. fine. There's yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. Right. Having all your plants in rows. Uh, having, um, you know, the, an edge, maybe whether it's wooden, even a lot of um, the raised boxes that you are, you know, even I'm promoting because, you know, who wants to bend over all the time, right? We want the garden to be raised a little bit. And there's been a lot on the market, especially with uh, the boom in vegetable gardens with COVID and with the pandemic, you know, everybody wants to grow their own food or try growing your own food. So, but they are all usually rectangles or squares, right? And uh, it does, it makes sense that that's going to be the case. But uh, I think there's still ways where we can, you know, dress them up. Because I find that initially when you um, first plant a vegetable garden, there's really not much to see, right? You got itty bitty baby plants. They're, you know, like eight inches tall. And there's not much to see. And then midsummer, sure, certainly they flourish. They start to grow some faster than others, depending on the, on the vegetable and really start to take off. So, you know, your June and August, especially the beginning of August, you know, it is a lush kind of attractive garden, but then as things, as the harvest starts waning and things stop producing and things start to go dormant, kind of September and October can be a little sad looking, you know, the, the browning leaves, uh, things that are stopped producing, depending on the variety that you had. So again, you know, it's kind of a short season. So I think there's a lot of ways that we can make that rectangle or that square look a little bit more attractive. Um, and also I wanted to talk about some other ways for those of us who don't have a ton of space for just a standalone vegetable garden in their yard, but still want to grow food, how we can maybe incorporate growing food in our, even our front yards. So um, so yeah, so thinking about the box in the back, there, what about putting a small low hedge around it? Uh, that's something you could easily do. You could do it with um, something like boxwood. You could do it with something, even privet, something that might be a little, because boxwood is expensive. So depending on the size of your, uh, of your yard and your boxes, you could have, and I like the idea of having something evergreen because that's another thing in the winter, 
a vegetable garden doesn't look great either, right? You have this big, big rectangle in your backyard. So you could do something um, like a privet hedge that you can keep low. You could, um, and, and there's a few other hedge materials uh, as well that you can, and even currants. I was reading an article by our one and only Stephen Biggs, who has his own uh, show here on uh, Reality Radio 101, and his latest newsletter talked about currants and how nice of a hedge that they make. And that kind of inspired me as well, because then I think now you've got the pretty hedge, but you've also got more food. So I think that's a really good idea. Um, so in addition to that, I think there's always a way to go up, especially if we don't have a lot of space. So adding things that would add interest to that rectangular square, but also um, give you maximize the space. So, you know, adding obelisks, to the garden, um, adding big pot, whether that's in right into the ground, or you could add big pots in the garden, in the center of the garden with let's say maybe herbs and maybe something like invasive, like uh, mint or oregano in those big pots, but then also have the obelisk sitting in the big pots and having like your scarlet runner beans or your cucumbers climbing up. So again, I hope you're I'm expressing, it's one thing about radio, right? I, I'm all excited about the visuals, but uh, so I'm hoping I'm communicating that to you. Um, so you can really make that big rectangular square look interesting, even outside of the seasons. Absolutely. And you yeah. know, there, there's a lot of people that, when we're talking about rectangle and squares of gardens, a lot of people, like you're saying, Joanne, they use pots. Uh, mm -hmm. as well. And of course, those pots are round if you're looking for a different shape. But you don't have to really dig up your yard. You, As you say, you can have pots uh, or mm -hmm. raised gardening, you know, raised beds, yeah. things. So a lot of people that may want to get into gardening or try it, their thing is, I don't want to dig up my lawn or my grass. You don't have mm -hmm. to do that, folks. There's a whole That's different, right. there's many different ways to grow vegetables without ruining your lawn, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And the, the amount of different types of raised gardens that are available, um, whether it's from a big box store or whether it's from um, uh, a garden center or uh, even Lee Valley, if anybody's familiar with Lee Valley, you know, there's a variety of different sizes. Some of them are, are plastic. Some of them are made out of wood and they can really go, you know, of course you need sun. So that's where, you know, that comes in. We're finding that right sunny spot. But the, the benefit there of those raised boxes, sometimes they don't have to be on the lawn. Like you said, Gary, not everybody wants to, they're not sure they want to do this right. as a commitment, right? Ripping up their lawn. That's right. So, you know, you can still put a raised garden bed on a patio. You can set it, you know, corner of your sunny, sunny corner of your yard, maybe even put down four patio stones, you know, level it off a little bit. And then you can have your, your, your raised planter there. Uh, exactly. And, the thing is, we know most people, when they decide to grow something, usually it's always the same, like we grow uh, tomatoes and we grow peppers, mm -hmm. zucchini. Are those basically easy to grow? I mean, besides sun and water, is there anything that you really need to do to have healthy plants if a beginner wanted to try to grow those things? Well, there's always a few things. I mean, knowing you're growing the right type, the right size of plants. I think tomatoes of all of that, tomatoes tend to be a little bit trickier because of the, we learned last week with Emma Biggs of the different types of tomatoes. So the indeterminate ones will get quite tall. So you need a lot more space and a lot more um, attention to staking and supporting those plants. But there, you certainly can get uh, dwarf and semi-dwarf tomato plants that will be perfect in a, a raised container, if that's what you're looking for. Pepper plants, uh, they need a full sun, so they definitely need heat, but they usually don't take up that much space. Hello, our family grows um, jalapeno peppers very successfully, and uh, they they do quite well. They don't get too big, but they, they do produce a lot, so that is nice. Um, zucchinis also can get a little bit big, and um, but there are some varieties now where they are a bit more uh, appropriate for containers. Um, so that's nice to know. So pretty much anything you can put in the garden, you can put in a container. The challenge with the container, as well as a raised, you know, one of those raised uh, garden beds that are, um, you know, up off the ground is water because they, you know, they're going to dry out much quicker than something that you you plant in the ground and you water and you mulch. 
you know, the roots have a lot farther to go to, to bring up that water. So that's something like if you have a cottage or if you're going away for three weeks in the summer, then, you know, container gardening might not be for you. It might be better to have uh, uh, something more in the ground. Or have a neighbor um, come over and water it. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Right? There's lots of, yeah, drip irrigation where you can even set a timer. You know, it goes off at even the homemade ones. You can hook up to your 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 house and have a timer and it comes on for 20 minutes, you know, twice a day kind of thing in the, in the heat of the summer. So there's certainly, um, you know, there's where there's a will, there's a way, I like to say, you know, for if you're sure. really excited about doing it, then there's usually a solution. There is. And, um, and, and yeah. folks, we're not talking about, let's say you wanted to grow corn. <laughs> That's mm-hmm. a totally different thing. Uh, most likely you would have to have a plot of land or a small garden mm-hmm. to do that. And same with like potatoes, carrots, those type of things, right? I would imagine those have to be in the ground because they're root crops where they grow underneath the ground, right? That would probably be like even potatoes and carrots might be a little bit harder to grow in a pot, I would think. I'm not 100 percent sure. No, Matt has talked about his growing of his potatoes on his balcony. So actually, as long as the pot. So I think that once you get into pots with vegetables and herbs, I think the bigger, the better. So you're not dealing with 10 inch pots or 14 inch pots. You are dealing with like a big, you know, 24 inch, 36 inch pot. Um, And and potatoes can be done successfully in containers. So that's good. But it just needs to be a wide pot and a deep pot. So, um, and I think for many, like you with those tomato plants that are going to get very tall, you need it to be bigger so that it can hold the amount of nutrients, not only the water, but the nutrients, because you need to commit to adding, you know, in addition to the potting soil and the triple mix and some manure and some compost, it really needs to be a good quality soil. And it can yeah. be a little bit harder to amend it. Um, when it's in a container as opposed to something in the ground. Mm-hmm. So um, so the more nutrients and the, the more soil there, the better. Okay. So, and soil yeah. quality is important. I mean, obviously if you're, if you're doing a garden in your yard and you're digging up your, um, your yard, that is the soil that you're using, but it can be offset by adding certain things to give it more nutrients and stuff. But if you're going to a pot You want to make sure you use quality soil. Is it possible, Joanne, for someone to get a pot and dig a bunch of dirt from their yard and put it in the pot and use that as soil? You can. Often, though, it's it's heavy, right? So if you want to move it around or if you need to take it somewhere else. So usually it's good. It's okay to add a bit of potting soil, uh, something that's a little lighter. Mm Mm-hmm to that mix so mixing mixing your your soil in with some potting soil just to make it not um so heavy of a soil for a container and so it is kind of especially they tend to be a little bit more transportable right people want to take it from point a to point b um so but you know you you can if it's in the spot and it's not going to move then yes you can definitely take your soil and uh, make sure it has good drainage but you can take soil from the garden and put it in the pot. But again, in bigger, big pots. Yeah. And and I guess the rule of thumb here is the bigger, the better when it comes to pots, right? You want the the room for the roots to grow properly and to spread out. And uh, so, you know, uh, that would be probably a rule of thumb for a lot of people that want to try potted uh, growing crops, we'll say vegetables, the bigger, the better. And that, and that's really good advice as well. If you're just tuning in, you are listening to Down the Garden Path with Joanne Shaw. And you could send us an email. Our email address is instudio101 at gmail.com. Instudio101 at gmail.com. All right. Uh, I, well, let's pause the backyard for a minute and maybe look at, could we uh, incorporate edibles and vegetables in our front yards? And I think you can, you know, especially because sometimes people have um, maybe not a lot of space in their backyard. Or I know you have this challenge, Gary, in that you don't have a lot of sun in the backyard, right? Right. I don't. Right. Right. But often people will have more sun maybe in the front yard. So I think there is definitely ways to find those really sunny spots. And you mentioned root vegetables like carrots. I mean, that's perfect. Carrots, beets. They have really interesting foliage above the ground, but the actual vegetable is in the ground. So you don't really see it, you know, so you can certainly tuck those 
amongst your plants. I think kids would love that to know that they can come home from school and watch the carrot growing in their front yard. Right. <laughs> um, garlic, which of course we don't plant until the fall. So if you haven't planted it yet, then that's okay. But I've grown garlic in my front yard because it really doesn't, it comes up and it's green and it's fairly innocuous until it gets the, the cool looking scapes, which you then trim. And then you're digging up garlic later. So garlic's a little bit, timing is a little bit off, but you can absolutely do it um, in your front yard. It's things like chives, onions, radishes. And like I mentioned, jalapeno peppers don't often get to be very big plants, but they're really cool looking, especially when they have the shiny green peppers on them. So you can also tuck those in or maybe group them together in, uh, in a sunny spot in your garden. But son, for ba- basically though, for most vegetables... We would say most of the time you need a lot of sun. That's correct, right? Yes, that is correct. Yeah. And and and, and um Joanne, when, when when you're when you're not talking and I talk and then you start to talk again, just to let you know, um you're very, very low and then all of a sudden your mic kicks in loud. Oh, really? So like okay. yeah, I'm not sure why that is. It's a setting, I guarantee it. But is it a setting? Yes. Okay. So I do have a new computer. And so with my old head headset with a new computer, so we haven't had a chance to test that out, but uh, hopefully that sound is okay and not too annoying for everybody. How is that sound, Gary? No, you're fine now. Now, when okay. I'm talking now for a minute, if you're quiet for a minute or two listening to my big mouth, uh, mm-hmm. then when you come back in, your volume is really low and then it gets real loud. So it's a setting. Mm-hmm. Okay. But right now we're right. good. So, yeah, we're good. Now, what about, as you say, um, water is important as well. Now, of course, it would depend upon the question I'm going to ask is it depends upon the weather, how hot it is, humidity, all that. But normally, would someone every day, if you didn't have rain, say, for a couple weeks on end, regardless of the temperature, would you water your vegetables every day? Is that important or would you go every other day? And, and then how do you know when to water? Yeah, they are, it's important to water pretty much every day. Every day, so, right. Yeah, so whether it's, a, and sometimes in the front garden, your other plants, if you're planting amongst other plants, they may not need it every day. Okay. So it would be more of a hand watering. So something that's, so that's something to think about too, that you're using a watering can and you're watering at the base of the plant, of the plant. You're not necessarily putting a sprinkler on like you are with your lawn. You are going to the base of all your different vegetables and plants uh, in between your ornamental plants. Um, you know, I'm thinking like shrubs, like if you have hydrangeas and you have peonies, that type of thing that also love the sun. But they're not going to require, they're going to require some water through the season, but they're certainly not going to require the same amount as your vegetables. Okay. So you really will be using, you know, filling a watering can and using a watering can to water, which also makes it easier to, when it does come time to add maybe a little bit more um, um, nutrients to those plants. Maybe it's a fish emulsion or even just a, a, a water soluble uh, fertilizer, you can easily do that in the water and watering cans. So you're kind of fertilizing and watering at the same time. So that's something you can do every two weeks to your vegetables Okay, that are in your garden. Yeah. So we know water and we know sun mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. very important. And you did kind of touch on this and that, but what about fertilizer for that stuff? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think starting off with a good, um, for good soil, like we mentioned earlier too, even in the front yard, if it's around your other plants, maybe more compost or manure, you're going to add to those hole, the, the plant holes when you're planting the plants. And then the water soluble fertilizer, like I mentioned. So when you're watering every two weeks, adding some fertilizer, some liquid fertilizer into your watering can, and then you can be watering and fertilizing those, those vegetables, uh, regardless of where they are, um, you know, in amongst your other plants. Yeah. Okay. So remember- there's also something called a partier. Have you ever heard of that term, Gary? Uh, partier? No, I haven't. Yeah. So the definition, I looked it up and uh, it actually means, oh, where did I go? I wrote it down. <laughs> well, a garden with a path in between it. So you could, and we've seen several ornamental ones where you picture four squares, um, you know, with a, with paths down the center. So they're not touching these four squares, right? So you've got kind of have four corners and then you have a path down the middle and the path going the other, like North and South, basically Mm -hmm. North, South and East and West. And then you've got the four corners. 
So that's, and often they are, um, you know, uh, bordered with like a hedge material, often boxwood. And um, that's something you could do. You know, a lot of people are turning their front lawns into gardens. And that's something you could look at doing in the front yard is having, you know, almost like four little mini gardens as one garden yeah. with the path down the center. I've seen them where maybe in the two opposite corners, that's where you're growing some hydrangeas or some flowering perennials and pollinators. And then in the opposite two, you were growing the vegetables. So, you know, you've kind of got, you know, four different little gardens in one, um, that type of thing. So and that's that something looks more, good. yeah, it looks, looks cool. good. It's, it's, it's definitely more attractive to look at and, um, it doesn't screen vegetable garden, you know, especially right. in the front yard, it can be look, a look attractive. And even in the winter or in the spring, when nothing's really happening in the vegetable garden, you still have an aesthetic, like a really nice aesthetic to look at. And it so. also hides some of your veggies from your neighbors who will steal them. That's so. <laughs> right. That's right. You don't want anybody uh, doing that to, unless it's zucchini, because don't we always have uh, oh, plenty. a person who, uh, yeah, plenty of zucchini or cucumbers. That's right. That type of thing. And, um, and if you make them bigger, even bigger, you could still even fit maybe an obelisk, um, you know, so that's like a trellis, but it's more like a teepee, I think, like a metal oh, teepee. Oh, yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. nice. So when, so folks, when you're thinking about a vegetable garden to put in, unlike, let's say, a really nice flower garden, you're thinking, well, I don't know if I want to do that because vegetables really, they're not that good looking or this or that and all that. Well, Joanne just gave some great tips. You can hide, disguise your vegetable garden. So that should not be an issue why you don't want to grow one. Because there's all kinds of really cool options to do things to dress up a vegetable garden and make it look really, really good, especially if you put it in the front yard. So those are the tips from Joanne. And if you're just tuning in, because I see you are, folks, down the garden path right here at Joanne Shaw, you can email us in studio101 at gmail.com. Right on. So now at this time of year, could people be starting any kind of veggies by seeds? Is that what they would normally start right now? Yes, you would be starting seeds inside. So now about now is the time to start tomatoes. Um, peppers should have probably been started already because they do need a little bit longer to germinate. So it really depends. Uh, of course, it depends where you are and um, your last frost date. But um, I find it's never too late because even if plants need a little bit longer inside before you take them outside, um, that's okay, you know. Uh, so yeah, so if you want to start seeds, uh, definitely now is the time to, uh, to, to look for some. Um, often right now, I mean, most grocery stores even have some seeds for sale wow. to look at as well as some, uh, some seeds, uh, seed suppliers online. I know I ordered some tomato seeds. Julia has been a past uh, guest, a frequent guest of ours here. Mm -hmm. So I did order some tomato plants from her. So they haven't arrived yet. Some seeds, sorry. I've ordered some seeds from her and they have not arrived yet. So they should be here soon. Um, so yeah, so that is uh, something people can start with. Uh, I have just a little light setup that I bought at Canadian Tire. So it's just one single long bulb on a little stand. And I have my I don't know, I guess it's like a, a 10 by 20 tray, you know, seed tray. Yeah. And that's what I'm doing. And so, yeah, so now is definitely the good time, but it's okay. If that's not your cup of tea, I know I, I'm trying to do it because I really want to do it, but it, it historically has not been my cup of tea because I just don't seem to have time. So um, it's all right to wait until mid-May when the vegetables are in the garden center and buy the plants already established. That's perfectly fine as well. And what and when do usually when do tomato plants and pepper plants and the actual plants come out in the box stores or your garden center, what have you? When do they usually come out? Is it sometime in April? No, it's still a little too cool. They're still um, in the house, greenhouses at the at the suppliers growing. So they tend to not bring them in because the risk of frost is still um, so strong up until mid-May for us. And our area, GTA, May 24th is about the, the last frost date. So it can be a little risky, although you will start to see them in the nurseries, usually in the under plastic or in protected areas mid-May. So they will start to bring them in in May when they, and, and they'll keep them in areas where they can control the, the temperature. 
Um, they won't be putting them outside in the on the benches and stuff quite yet because if we get a bad frost, then they risk you know damaging those plants. Uh, so yeah, so usually it is mid it is mid May for the most part. I mean, there's going to be a few yeah. you'll see things kind of trickle in like a little bit at a time. But they're not going to put bring in a huge volume because it's a lot to manage moving them in and out, right? Uh, right. That type of thing. So and and yeah. when and when people let's say mid May when they purchase those because they're available, that's the time frame when they should put them in the ground right away about mid May for more at least no. where we live. Yes. Yeah. No, you're still going to want to wait. So I think it's 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 a fine line between shopping early enough you know, when they first come in, yep. so you get the variety you're looking for, but still knowing that they're not quite ready to get planted yet. So maybe you're keeping them in the garage or in a like a screened in veranda or something like that. So they can still handle some cool temperatures. Maybe if you're very good, um, and this is where I struggle, where you put them outside during the day and then bring them in at night where it gets cold. But I always afraid that I'm going to miss it. Right. And, and, and forget them. So if you're really good, then that's something you would do. So that's called hardening off. So they're not quite ready to go right into the ground yet, because again, the, the threat of frost is still, um, still around, you okay, know, we so, got a hard frost and what would make it. And we're in the Toronto area for those, I know yeah. listening around the world, you're in different growing zones, but we're, right. we're, what zone are we? We are 5B. Okay, so for listeners in 5B, the question we can answer, would is there a time frame now, usually, let's say the end of May, where we would put those in, where we're thinking, okay, there's not going to be any more frost, we hope, right? So if they buy, let's say, plants uh, middle of May, whatever, hold on to them and don't really put them in the ground outside until, we'll say, the end of May, basically, is that what we're looking at? And really just pay attention to the uh, to the weather forecast, you know, because we have had those exceptional May we May months where, you know, or years where May has been like, you know, very, very nice. And there's not, a you know, an idea at all about a frost. And then there's been other really cool dicey. I mean, I've I've designed on May 24th on that date and it was snowing and I had my winter coat on. Wow. So it you know, you just don't know. Yeah. And I think that's what makes it a little bit challenging. So um, so keeping them in the garage is fine. Like I said, a screened in back porch, um, you know, a cooler basement maybe. But, you know, they do still want some light, but it's it's usually not a long time because then, you know, after that 24th for us, about the 24th, some of the um, other zones, you know, you might be looking at the first week of June. So there's like a little bit of a window there. And um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's what my advice is, okay. is for you. When people then finally put, let's just talk about tomatoes for a minute. When you put tomato sure. plants in the ground, Everyone sometimes, they always talk about spacing where you should not, mm -hmm. you know, and I've seen people plant different things and it's really close. And then I've seen people plant stuff where they put one plant down and then they go three and a half feet over and put another plant down. What is the rule of thumb, say, for tomato plants to grow the spacing? really depends on the variety that you're planting. So I think looking at the seed pack, whether it's a seed package or if you're buying the actual plant, Gary, then the tag, you know, keeping those tags so that you can read what is the size that's, that uh, this plant is going to be. Um, often they do grow up more than they grow wide, but um, you still do want to leave some air circulation between the plants. And often you could buy, like, I kind of like it when I do tomato plant, pepper plant, tomato plant, pepper plant, and kind of break up you know, uh, break things up that way. So that's something to do. That's cool. Especially for people. Yeah. Especially if you're, um, I have a long narrow bed up against a fence. So that can be handy. You can do a, a few different, if we pop back to talking about things in the backyard and most of us have, you know, a fenced space Yeah. and, um, and usually the best, you know, they want to put, you know, get the garden away from the center of the yard and kind of maybe up against the fence. So those are things you can maybe just take out, um, you know, three feet from the fence, two and a half feet, uh, as, especially if you're just new and you don't want to commit, like you said, about a, a huge big rectangle in the middle of your yard. You can you can kind of just deal with that smaller space up against the fence. Yeah. You can do things like um, we've grown successfully. We've hung some uh, chains, some, uh, you, you know, the plant chains or you see them like a coated chain that you get mm -hmm. at Home Depot yep. from a cup 
we put like a, a screw down a cup hooks into our fence and hung chains down and it's really cool because we managed to grow cucumbers up the up the chain we've managed to grow small watermelons up the chain um, you could do beans and things like scarlet runner beans and peas that grow up uh, so yeah, so you can really kind of almost, you know, you're, you're really making the most of the space because now you're going vertical in addition to making, I think makes it look prettier too, because you've got a kind of a green wall. Yeah, for sure. And it's decorative and, but it's mm. serving a purpose, but it makes it, it makes it look good. You know, you do a really nice job on that and it's, yeah. uh, you know, you don't have to say, well, these are my veggies because it looks so cool that, you know, you're doing something unique and mm -hmm. so folks again you're listening to down the garden path with joanne shaw if you'd like to write us an email our email address is in studio 101 at gmail.com you know we're talking about um growing vegetables and kind of maybe sort of decorating decorations around your veggies there's a lot of options you have to be creative you know and you can do the right thing but the more most important thing is when you're growing vegetables sunlight and water that's what, yeah. you know. Now, what about, Joanne, if someone says, okay, I'm kind of good with the vegetables. I want to try to grow fruits. Now, what fruits? Now, again, folks, we're talking our area per se. Um, uh, what type of fruits is it possible to grow where we live? Okay. Strawberries would probably be the easiest um, to grow. One of the easiest. So some of the berries. So strawberry. There's a few different kinds of strawberry. Some of them you could even grow in containers or hanging baskets. Um, that's a really fairly easy plant to grow. Raspberries and blackberries. Now they are gonna, they are easy, quote unquote, almost too easy to grow in the sense that they can be very, can be a little more on the invasive side. Mm. And they also have thorns. So they're not something to be in a yard. I mean, to me, I think you need a larger space and you need, it's a commitment because once you plant them, it's, it's really hard to remove them. Um, often people will move into like, move into new homes and they're like, what is that plant in that garden? You know, with all the thorns, we can't get rid of it. And it's like, well, it's, we keep cutting it back. Well, it's raspberries. And uh, so they can be a little bit of a tough plant, Ooh, really? but tough in that sense, in the sense that it, um, you know, it's a commitment. It, it's once you plant them and they're established, they're not going anywhere. But they are, they will provide fruit. So, um, so that's really nice thing. So it's, and I think, again, it's something that's fun for kids to be able to eat plants. Eat, I mean, eat food right off of the, right in their backyard, off of the plants that they've grown. So that is a good thing. We do have one um, that we, this will be its third season where we have successfully grown a raspberry plant in a pot, a very large pot. As I said to my son, I didn't want to, because like I said, it's invasive, right? It's hard to get them out. And they yeah. do kind of run, they'll run under the fence to the neighbors and, and that type of thing. Cause that's often a, another dilemma that people all of a sudden get something cause it's growing on the other side of their fence. You know, the yeah. neighbor started planting it. Um, so we've, you know, last year's um, harvest wasn't huge. Uh, often they are second year. So the canes need to establish for a second year before they start pr producing fruit. So okay. fruit can tend to be a little bit more, um, a little bit more of a skill level. So I think it's not necessarily a start tomato. I mean, sorry, strawberries, I think are fairly straightforward. Um, but some of the other ones like raspberries and blackberries can be a little bit challenging. Things like elderberries and currants are other berry type plants. They need a little bit more space, especially elderberries can get quite large, um, but great pollinators. And you can make elder, elderberry jam. You can make uh, currant jam. So those are uh, neat features in the garden uh, to look at. And and so would you say, though, as far as maintenance is concerned, if there's any, are berry plants and all that stuff easier to grow than, let's say, tomatoes and cucumbers and all that stuff? Or is there more maintenance on veggies than there are fruits? You know what? I, I don't know if it's a, a maintenance thing as much as they would be perennial. So you are only, once you plant that elderberry bush or that currant bush or um, that raspberry bush, you're not going to have to plant it every year. Okay. So from that standpoint, right? So once you plant it, it's coming back every year. Now you may have to do different things to them. Um, like I said, the raspberries, you have to kind of watch the area. 
they are thorny so you don't want them you know next you know you that narrow path between you and uh and the pathway into the backyard you know sometimes that that's a nice and sunny spot but you're walking past so you don't ne necessarily want these large long um raspberry canes that are full of thorns and on a walkway type of thing so i think you have to be a little bit more thoughtful as to where you're putting them um, but that is easier in the sense that it's it's one and done so once you plant it and it has the space um, you have to read a little bit about your specific variety. You know, like I said, there's some uh, raspberry bushes that may produce raspberries every year. There are some that may produce every second year or on the second year canes, you know, on the stems. Yeah. So there's a little bit more, you know, a, a little bit more homework, let's say, but you're not having to um, certainly do like crop rotation and move it to a different spot every year like you are with your other vegetables. So it, it's it's nice that they're perennial. Okay, so if someone grows a berry plant, say, mm -hmm. um, how when, when things are fully ready to be picked, ripe, how do they keep animals from picking at all that stuff? Do, do people still use, like, do they cover them with netting and stuff like that, or what do they do? Yeah, you can. If you, um, you mean, often people who are trying to grow grapes, which can be yeah. challenging, right, yeah, to bite yeah. the, the, the birds for the grapes, they often will resort to some kind of netting raspberries as well you know if you it is tricky because they do and, and that happens even with tomato plants never mind you know cherry tomato plants you'll find a couple that have been like picked off the stem and and bitten into and then dropped on the ground okay. so pests can be a little bit of a challenge so things like a netting um whirly wills like things like that that kind of distract uh the animals away from them can help but uh, definitely you are and i know elderberries too you know, the timing, you know, I have a girlfriend who grows several bushes and uh, when she first started growing them, you know, she had to try and beat, beat the, the birds, beat the cedar wax wings would always show up one day. And she say, you know, the one day it looks perfect. And she's like, oh, I better pick these tomorrow. And then she wakes up and the birds have cleaned out the, yeah. cleaned out the bush. So, um, so that definitely can happen. So it's something you have to really uh, pay attention to. Okay. Yeah. For and sure. Yeah, and there's a lot of distraction things you can buy in the store, right, to scare animals mm -hmm. away and pests and things like that, right? So yeah, yeah for yeah. sure. Well, Definitely. We, we, I think we got a few emails I forwarded to you. Yes, I think you did. So, so do you, you want to read some of those? Sure, I'd love to. Okay. So um, how's my sound doing? Right now you're okay? I'm okay, all right. Um, so Larry has written in and he's saying, do vegetable plants attract rodents more than just flowers? Well, I think, yes, it depends on what rodents. I'm assuming you're thinking like of mice, uh, things like that. Um, yes, they would because it's, it's food, a food source, right? right? Yeah, so there, yeah. yeah. So there, if you have lettuce and carrots and, and beets and things like that, um, they, that is going to may attract rodents. Usually not. I mean, there's usually other things that they want to eat. Um, so I don't know that it's a massive problem, um, but it's something to consider. And uh, I think that's why it's important to mulch your garden and to keep the garden clean, not leaving like rotting food or things that have maybe fallen yeah. to always keep, you know, keep it a level, which you want to do for the food as well. Yeah. Um, and mice don't really typically bother with um, flower gardens. Although sometimes it gives you bird seeds and, and bird, seed, bird feeders, that type of thing, that could be attracting uh, rodents and, and chipmunks um, as well. I mean, I know I've struggled with chipmunk in my garden and then in he kind of goes and, and burrowed underneath stair, stairs too. Yeah. So that can be a bit of an issue. So I hope that helps, okay. uh, Larry. Thank yeah. you, Larry, for writing in. Thank you. Let's see. Um, Oh, thank you. So Ron has said that he liked the tips tonight. Thanks for listening, Ron. Thank you, Ron. And, uh, and you know, by the way, uh, off topic a little bit, I know that mm -hmm. uh, yourself and Matthew are writing a book or are in the process. We so are. We're hoping there'll be a lot of tips and, as you say, tricks in that mm -hmm. book when that comes out. So, folks, stay tuned for that. You know, hopefully we're going to get that out as soon as uh, we possibly can. Really tried to make it for the last uh, for the end of March. We got a really big draft 
actually today. And we have a big meeting to review the draft with our editors tomorrow. So there's a little update there for anybody wondering about the book. Nice. And we're excited because uh, it does have a lot of tips and tricks. We're just trying to perfect it with pictures and graphics that really make things um, as straightforward and as simple as possible. So we're really trying to put a lot of detail into that. So, uh, so yeah. So stay tuned. We're close. We're very, very close. Excellent. Do you, do you have a mm-hmm. title yet that you could say or not? Um, well, we do believe it's it's also going to call be called Down the Garden Path, but okay. we'll have like a little subtitle that that is one of that. So I think one of the first things on the agenda for tomorrow is just to nail down the title. So excellent. Yeah, we look forward yeah. to that so thank for you sure. For asking. Oh, thanks, Gary. Thank you, everybody um, who's asked for it and who's written in about it. We really appreciate it. And thank you for your patience. Um, so Sue, who's a longtime listener. Hi, Sue. She's asking if she can use seeds from last year. Mm. Yes, for the most part, Sue, there will usually be a um, now. OK, Sue, I don't know. Are you talking about seeds that you took from your plants, which is still yes, or seeds that you bought in packages? And I have some here. And you can see me with my little packages. Oh, yeah. So there's usually a date on the back. Um, so this one, this I have parsnips, which we didn't successfully weren't able to grow last year or a few years ago. So this one um, says so by December 2021. So this one, the less chance of, you know, and it's always much like yogurt. It's a best before date. So it may yeah. grow. It may not grow just because it's, you know, the yogurt was last Friday. You know, it still might be edible. Right. 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 <laughs> oh, for sure. Um, for the most part, you can uh, grow seeds that you bought last year but definitely check the best before you know the the grow before date um will be on those seed packages okay great so so hopefully that helps thank you for your question and oh berry plants george is asking are berry are berry plants perennials yes we were just talking about that uh and they are uh raspberries strawberries Uh, Many of the the berry plants are perennials. So once you plant them, they they will grow. Now, people in the GTA, they often, um, nurseries are promoting the blueberry plants, some some different ones that can grow in pots or, or, excuse me, in the garden. They, as much as they've been promoted, um, I've heard, and I I was listening to a talk with our garden club a a few weeks ago, um, berries blueberries are particularly challenging they really need acidic soil and uh they can be very very challenging to grow so Hmm. that's something you know you could try giving it you know trying out but uh definitely read up on it and figure out how you can add uh, more amendments to the soil and really adding that acidity that um blueberries need so that is one kind of exception but yes, uh, rhubarb, of course, right? Rhubarb comes up every year. Uh, so there's several plants, several berries that are, most of them are all uh, perennial. You know, and yeah. here's a little joke. I don't know if you're, uh, if our listeners or you, Joanne, you remember the guy on TV, uh, his name is Ron Papil. And he used to always have all these uh, showtime things, the knives, the ovens, the this, the that. Remember that guy? Yeah. Okay. Well, his model used to be set it and forget it, right? Well, for perennials, for your listeners, you know, basically it's plant it and forget it, except for the watering and that stuff. And that's what's great about perennial fruits. If you really like these certain berries, you don't have to replant every year. And that's great. So it's not like you're putting in new tomato plants or this type of thing, right, which are annuals. So, uh, yeah, berry, even with the challenges of growing specific species of berries, you know, uh, berries could be a good thing if you want some fruit and give it a go. And once you get them in the ground and you put them in the right place and you take care of them and with the sun and the water, it's the same every year, hopefully. So, right? Yes. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And they can be pretty. Uh, as well, we were talking a bit about, you know, making uh, your gardens more attractive. So bordering your vegetables, maybe if you do have a big rectangle in your garden, maybe you're adding tomato or uh, strawberries around the border, uh, something like that. Some of the ever bearing that that produce fruit all summer, you know, that would be like a pretty edge to your garden. Yeah. 
you know, so there are some ways to kind of mix and match, you know, vegetables and fruit to make the garden a little bit more, uh, more attractive. And you know what um, I we noticed? We didn't even talk about herbs too, Gary. Okay. Yes. What were you going to say? I did one question. I noticed a lot of people, well, maybe not a lot, but a people that I've mm-hmm. known when they do grow certain vegetables in their yard, for some reason, the flower of choice for edging or a border has been marigolds. Now, is that something, the norm, is that something you see a lot in your profession? Yeah, they tend to be um, something we call like companion planting, that insects don't really like the scent of uh, marigolds. So that is often a very common practice to, um, so I have a whole list here of different uh, perennials that you could plant. So one, it's a pollinator. So the bees uh, and beneficial insects are attracted to them, but yet some of the bad bugs don't really like them. So mm-hmm. that's one common thing. Um, so something else to think about is planting. So you can plant things that like um, discourage insects, like even basil, some of the something with more of a stronger scent, some basil, some salvia, some of those herbs can be a bit of a deterrent because they've got such a strong scent to pests and diseases in the vegetables, but yet they're, they're going to attract pollinators. So they, um, you know, the, the bees, the honeybees, the na- native bees are attracted to them. So the more bees in your garden, the more things get pollinated and the happy, the more productive your garden is. Okay. So, um, so yeah, so that's often something you can think of. That's another way to make your vegetable garden uh, in the, let's say the backyard more attractive is by adding flowers. So whether it's annuals like uh, marigolds, pansies, even alyssum, you know, that tiny white or light pink flower that's very usually low to the ground and they're really tiny. That's called alyssum. alyssum and they right. all, yeah, they also attract uh, uh, bees to the garden. So that's something that and you we, can easily. And we want to attract bees, right? You said we want to. Because yeah. a lot of people, yeah. as you know, they're always afraid that something's going to sting mm-hmm. them or something, you know. But we need yeah. bees for pollination, correct? So we do. Yeah. Yeah. And often the really, the native bees are the bigger pollinators, even more than the honeybees. Mm-hmm. And really the bees don't really want to sting us, right? right? That's they right. die. Right. So it's, it's really, they've got a job to do. They're trying to do their job. And they're, it's, I think the, people fear the bees, but really it's those pesky wasps that are the doing wasp, the stinging right, for right. the most part. Right. And not necessarily the bees. They are, they're too busy, you know, trying to collect the pollen. The busy bee, right. Um, that's right, busy bee. So there definitely are annuals that you can intersperse with your vegetable gardens to attract things mm-hmm. to, like you said, the marigolds kind of uh, discourage insects. And also I think it just adds color and beautifies the vegetable garden. But there are things, perennials that you can also add to a vegetable garden that are there year round and even for a longer season uh, than the vegetables. Okay. Things like um, anise hyssop is a really popular um, perennial that the bees love and the pollinators love. And it has uh, like a licorice smell to it mm. and it's got a beautiful purple flower. Um, Joe pieweed, also butterflies. Love Joe Pie Weed. These are annuals or perennials? These ones are perennials. Okay. So these will come back all the time. Uh, Joe Pie Weed comes, uh, little Joe won't, Joe Pie Weed will get quite tall, Mm -hmm. but uh, little Joe stays smaller and uh, is quite the pollinator. And again, it improves and makes makes it more attractive. We were talking about how can we beautify and uh, make the uh, vegetable gardens uh, look lo- better for a longer period of time, a longer season. Okay. Uh, another one is not, um, so it's Calamenta, ne- which is a nepeta. So not cat mint, it's called Calamenta. And hmm. it, it tends to be a white flower. So it looks very similar. It's still in the nepeta family, which is a cat mint family. But um, my girlfriend, Nancy, who's also a designer, and she says she she had a whole bunch of them on her front, uh, on her front driveway. And she was taking them to a job site to plant. And she said, literally the bees were following the plant wow. into the car. Wow. They so wanted to be part really? of that. Um, yeah. So they were definitely keen. Okay. Um, and of course, traditional ones that many of our gardeners know, Monarda, also called bee bomb, hence the name yep. of the tracks bees okay. and purple cone flower. Definitely the native purple cone flower, not necessarily, you know, the variety, the funny colored varieties, they tend to be, they don't tend to be um, as much of an attractant to, to the bees. 
Okay. They are more sterile. So I think interest, you know, that's another way we can in the front yard, you can add your vegetables to your shrubs and your perennials and kind of tuck them around. And then maybe in the backyard, if you do have are fortunate enough to have a, a bigger space for a vegetable garden, you can still intersperse some perennials uh, in that garden uh, to again, attract the pollinators, make it a little pretty, you know, maybe do a row, you know, we talked about a row of boxwood or row mm -hmm. of current. Well, maybe you're going to do a, a, an edge of something like lavender. Yeah. Right. Mm, that that's um, nice. is going to look, yeah, that's yeah. going to look attractive or cat mint. I do find cat mint in my garden uh, very successfully uh, attracts a lot of, uh, of the insects, the beneficial insects, and, and it blooms for a long period of time. So, so I think there are some ways that you can really, uh, design a lovely vegetable garden and then incorporate some other things uh, that we've mentioned tonight to yeah, just, and, quote, unquote, beautify it. Yeah, beautify it. And I was going to say as a joke, basically, you know, to, you know, people that you, if you want to hide it, you know, because mm -hmm. of whatever reason, you know, yeah. you can do all these things and no one would know but you. Your vegetables are inside, beautiful flowers, perennials on the outside, borders, edges, it look amazing, and no one will know but you when you go to pick that ripe tomato. That's right. That's right. And if the budget is no, you know, no object, then you certainly could build. I had um, a few years ago, we built a lovely little fenced-in garden. Oh, nice. Uh, for someone, her, her mom lived with her, and her mom was a big vegetable gardener, and they wanted to keep be able to keep the critters out. Yeah. So we built. I designed a nice little uh, wooden garden, you know, with the you know, with the really nice sides, you know, uh, shape to it and a little gate. And uh, wow, so, you know, nice. that's something that's certainly a much more of a commitment. But if that's something you want to do and, and then because we had the, the wood, you know, laid horizontal all around, you know, it, it did kind of hide, not hide it, but it, you know, it wasn't like a see through, you know, chain link fence. Yeah, it definitely separated the vegetables from the rest of the garden. So that was a nice feature. Um, too. So there are certainly ways you can really go above and beyond. Um, and I think I really want people to consider, because I know space for most people is really the issue. Yeah, yeah. So consider the vertical space. So consider the fences, consider things like I mentioned, the chains. Another thing to look into, and you're going to see them more and more in stores, are like uh, pockets. They're the kind of cloth pockets mm -hmm. or plastic pockets that can be screwed, literally screwed onto the fence mm -hmm. or again on hooks. And you can put, you can, you know, put different herbs, may, you know, maybe have a whole row of herbs at different levels on your fence. Um, or you could, of, of course, you can do, you know, flowers as well. Yeah. But that's something to, you know, really start looking at different ways uh, that you can use that space uh, to really take advantage of it. So and everything, and, um, the, and those pockets, I don't mean to interrupt you, but those pockets, yeah. everything goes in those pockets, your soil your plants or your seeds, right? And you would, and mm -hmm. well, that might even be better for animals because if it's on a fence, sure, any animal can really get to anything if they want to, but that might be right. a little bit better than being on the ground because some animals would not be able to reach that stuff. Yes, right? that's true. That's true. So you can look at um, woolly pockets. That's something they are, uh, I'm just looking at them here. I've used them in the past as well. Uh, woolly pocket gardens. So you're right, Gary, that they have the advantage of, of being easier with vegetable with the um, the animals. Yeah. The only trick is watering. So I've grown. I've successfully grown. I have one small one that I have screwed to my fence, and even though it's wool and it's an actual fabric, I think it's lasted five years. Really. And I've grown herbs and I've grown lettuce in in my woolly pocket. So. That is something to consider. So it's almost like a recycled material. Mm -hmm. I believe that they've used to create this. And this is just, just one, you know, variety that popped in my mind that I'm sure. familiar with one product. There are probably others out there, but it's really, and, you know, I've even seen people, if you check out Pinterest, you know, those shoe, um, you know, the, the pockets you put on a wall or maybe yeah, hang shoes? in a closet that sure. has a pocket for right, the shoes, right, right, right. right? You yeah. can put them up right. against the fence. Same principle. And again, the, yeah, same principle. The pockets are smaller. So I think yeah. herbs, I think you would have a harder time growing things like tomatoes and peppers, but certainly herbs or um, lettuce. Mm -hmm. You can grow a variety of different lettuce in there. 
and then you know just definitely figure out watering because well, uh those those little pots will uh will dry out quicker excellent. but uh, i think just using that space knowing especially if you have a, a small area and your sun let's say is limited and your space in the ground is limited then those are some things to really consider so absolutely yeah. well mm. we're out of time oh my goodness thank and you so much for being my partner yeah today. no problem uh joanne where could really quick where could folks find you contact you if they need to absolutely so don't forget to uh, down the garden path um, you can reach me at joanne at down to earth ca with a number two and uh, you can definitely check out my website and all my links are there so you can find me there well thank you folks for listening to another episode of down the garden path with joanne shaw and matthew dressing and you are listening to it right here on reality radio 101 goodbye for now Ready?